This is the Consciousness Podcast, and I'm your host, Stuart Preston. Each episode, I have a conversation with an expert in human consciousness. In this episode, I had the honor of speaking with Dr. Barrett Brogard. We discuss science and consciousness, brainwaves and neural correlates of consciousness, and her work with synesthesia and savant syndrome. Dr. Brogard is a professor of philosophy and the director of the Brogard Lab at the University of Miami. Her areas of research include philosophy of perception, philosophy of emotions, and philosophy of language. She's the author of several books, including Transient Truths and The Superhuman Mind. We had a great conversation and covered topics ranging from philosophy to hard science, all in the context of mind-brain duality. So please enjoy this episode with Dr. Barrett Brogard. I appreciate you uh, joining me here on the Consciousness Podcast. It's a real honor to have you uh, to talk yeah. about your areas of expertise. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, I mean, you come in with a, with a really varied background, you know, everything from philosophy to neuroscience. So um, maybe a good starting point would be to just share with us what your, what your notion, your overview of consciousness is and, and how you think it works. So I did my postdoc with David Chalmers and was inspired by his dualist approach to, to consciousness. Mm. Although I'm enough of a materialist that um, I don't think that science um, will not be able to explain consciousness. I think that science will be able to explain consciousness at some point in the future. Um, mm. But I do agree with uh, David Chalmers and also uh, many neurosciences uh, nowadays that um, perhaps we need to look at consciousness as, as a separate uh, fundamental entity, but not necessarily an, an entity that we can't measure scientifically, but an entity that, that can be measured sort of separately from, say, the structure of the brain or the material the brain is made of or the specific signals um, in the brain or the neurotransmitters and so on. Um, but something that, that could potentially be found uh, outside of brains as well, uh, but that doesn't have to mean that it's not scientific or not something that we can measure um, sort of what we could call elementary versions of consciousness. The, the, the big question, of course, will be, well, if there's um, a fundamental element of consciousness uh, that even has a, maybe a scientific nature to it, uh, how, do, how does that come together in a brain to actually create phenomenal consciousness, um, the, the kind of consciousness that humans and, and, and many animals um, have as well? So is that, is that kind of a panpsychism? I mean, are you thinking that there is a fundamental uh, um, force or element out there that is everywhere and that one day we'll be able to study that scientifically, you know, to use the scientific method and make predictable experiments and on, on this stuff? Is that is that where you're going with that? I, yeah, I think that, uh, that there's at least a, uh, a proto form of consciousness everywhere. Uh, so I don't think that the consciousness that we have as human beings or that my dog has, uh, I don't think that you will find that outside of, of living organisms or, or even in a tree. But I think that there's a, mm. um, a sort of a, a more elementary form of consciousness, uh, which is what goes into creating phenomenal consciousness that perhaps can be found outside of, uh, of, of living systems uh, and outside of the uh, animal kingdom. But yeah. uh, there are different versions of panpsychism, so, so I always hesitate to just sort of um, commit yeah. to panpsychism because panpsychism, sort of in the, the old-fashioned uh, definition, is just the, what, what you said, that you can find consciousness everywhere, or maybe that you can find a more elementary form of consciousness uh, everywhere, like proto consciousness or something like that. Um, yeah. But then, um, how that elementary form of consciousness is manifest that um, that differs depending on the kind of panpsychism that you embrace. So, so on one view that David Chalmers uh, that I did my postdoc with that he, his view. Uh, he, he actually has three different ways of, of thinking about consciousness. He's not sort of fully decided among them. 
But one um, one of his ideas is that perhaps um, inside the material world, so every every atom, every or even smaller bits of the material world, um, we have sort of physical stuff uh, that we can measure. So the physical properties that we measure. Uh, so, so say we measure the the mass of of something. Um, right. Uh, and but but it, but then there's something inside that that's an intrinsic property that gives rise to um, to consciousness when it's put together um, in a certain way, like in the human brain. So that's one way. It's also called uh, resilient monism, um, which 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 is basically just the view that there is something inside every bit of the world. There's an intrinsic, inherent quality property. Uh, that, yeah. Property. Yeah. That's not the thing we measure physically. And then there's the alternative uh, view. Um, there are many others as well, but a, a view that I find uh, more plausible, which is that there is uh, a fundamental uh, force, for example, we don't know what it, what it would look like yet, but it's a fundamental force, uh, just like we have other fundamental forces uh, that we already have detected, uh, gravity being being one we haven't even, um, so mm-hmm. we don't know enough about gravity, right, but there are other, other um, all these fundamental forces, just like we have fundamental um, particles, perhaps there's something that's a fundamental force that we still need to discover um, to be able to fully explain consciousness. Uh, and, and of course, even discovering that will not explain human consciousness or, or the consciousness of a dog, uh, because we, we still have to explain how the, those elementary forms of consciousness come together um, to, to form phenomenal uh, consciousness that's directed at the external world. Yeah, and it's uh, it's got a couple couple things that come up in my mind. One of the things I'm interested in is the survival of consciousness after death, and and then talking about this fundamental force or this property. You know, if, if you think about my my body has gravity. You know, I I my body has the gravitational force on other objects, but when I'm dead and buried, you know, the gravity doesn't still exist in something it's just no longer there because the, there's not the body to have the property and so it seems like yeah. that resonates with me that you know when the mind when the brain is done it's consciousness is gone it's not like it goes somewhere else it's just done because there's no mind to have those properties um, yeah i think that's correct so even if um we find out that that some version of panpsychism is correct um sort of a <clears throat> A scientific version, perhaps uh, it it wouldn't preserve your consciousness, right? Because yeah. your consciousness would. I mean, as when your brain is, is uh, deteriorates, then so does uh, that conscious uh, integration, the conscious mind that you have uh, that in, that deteriorates too. Of course, uh, there are other possibilities um, that perhaps there are ways to to upload your conscious state, right? But we, we don't know enough about consciousness to know whether that would be possible. Um, but, but that's uh, something that, that would perhaps be a way to preserve you or maybe a version of you. Um, but we don't know if that, that's, that's even possible because we don't fully know what consciousness is yet. Yeah. It does seem like it does give a possibility though, right? It's, if it's something that, uh, is a property. I wonder if that could be conserved along with the, the brain structure. It's, it's a, you know, I've talked to people in artificial intelligence in different areas that would definitely like to be able to upload or copy the brain. And, and this is one piece I have not heard anybody talk about yet. Yeah. So, so the, the question of course is what, what it takes to, to upload consciousness. It may be that we can only upload consciousness if we, if we can sort of replicate the, the brain exactly, right? Mm-hmm. So because your consciousness, this is not to say that consciousness couldn't be manifested in other things and brains, but if it's your consciousness and that was manifested in the brain, then maybe, maybe we need to, to replicate or create something that's brain-like in order to preserve or upload your consciousness. Uh, so, so that's just something we don't know. It's not, it's not obvious that we can get exactly the same sort of functioning or conscious functioning and conscious states uh, and, and also, the, of course, your unconscious states like the stored information in, in your brain that we can just sort of put that 
somewhere else and that and then preserve it that way it's not clear that we um that we can do that but but we we need to find out what consciousness is first before we can yeah. answer that question yeah that makes sense so then on the neuroscience side of it you know, we talk about the neural correlates of consciousness. And one of the things um, that I first found you was, was doing some reading on brain waves. Um, maybe you can tell us what, you know, what's happening in our brain when we have these phenomenal experiences. You know, I know with, with David Chalmers, you're talking about the qualia and the philosophical side of it. What, what are your thoughts on the, the neuroscience of it and the, these neural correlates on when we have a phenomenal experience, what's going on inside of our brain? Yeah, when, uh, so our, our brains um, create these waves. Uh, so, so you can measure, you, we use uh, EEG, so this is, uh, you put electrodes on the skull uh, where you can mm -hmm. measure uh, the, the, the waves that are created um, from the, the neurons. When the neurons fire, basically they can fire uh, in a way that's, um, that excites another neuron. Uh, or it can fire in a way that inhibits another neuron. Uh, so you can't mm -hmm. measure you can't measure the inhibition of another neuron, but you can measure how much um, activity or excitement uh, is generated in a certain area of the brain, and and that's measured uh, once you you analyze the data and so on. That's measured in terms of hertz, and so you have these uh, brain waves that. Divided, we divide them into different kinds of waves depending on how fast they are or how active or how excitatory they are. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, uh, so, for example, delta waves, theta waves, alpha waves, beta waves, and gamma waves are examples of brain waves that can be measured uh, in the brain. And, and they sort of reflect the activity of the neurons in the brain. Uh, and and there's there's a, a a lot to be said, but generally, in the the slower the brain waves, the slower you are basically mentally. Mm. So when when it comes down to that's not completely true, but when you come down to delta waves, um, so these are very very slow um, waves, slow frequ uh, very low frequency uh, waves. Mm -hmm. um, that's when you're in the deepest phases of sleep, that's uh, sometimes the kinds of waves that, uh, that you will have. And basically when you have slow brain waves like that, when they are dominant, um, you don't have any external awareness. So if you were not asleep, I don't know if that would even be possible, but if you're not asleep, but you had dominant delta waves, it's very slow waves, you would certainly not be aware of external uh, reality. Um, I don't think that anyone has actually been able to, to sort of meditate themselves into delta waves, but at least um, mm. the one up from that, uh, theta waves, they're, they're very, very slow still, um, but also, um, but, but they're, they're, they're a little bit faster, um, so the, the, the frequency is a little bit uh, greater than, the, than for the delta waves, and they have been observed in people who meditate. So they are, in that case, if you have those waves dominate your brain and you're not asleep, then you're probably meditating, but to an extent where you are not aware of anything outside of your own mind. Um, mm. And I don't just mean that you have your eyes closed and you're not perceive, perceiving the, um, the external world, you also just not, right. you're not recalling memories, uh, right? You're not thinking about what you had for breakfast or what you did yesterday. Yeah. Which your brain is not secreting those thoughts. Right, because those are still sort of external um, reality. So, so when you have these very low brain waves, you don't have anything that, that represents external reality. You're not sort of in the middle of um, imagining um, something well you might if it's if it's purely imagined that might be compatible uh with, with the slow waves um uh, but mm -hmm. but you don't have you certainly don't have something that sort of represents external reality in the sense of a memory or something like that or um or, or a perception but but of course these waves are still 
important um, for creating um, memories and so on. So, so they are um, frequent in sleep, and and some people speculate that uh, during the theta waves in sleep, maybe also when you meditate, if you can get uh, to that uh, or lower your brain activity, um, that can help sort of solidify memories uh, and learning. And then, so um, I guess that's. I had a real quick question. So the, the brain waves are created by the neuronal activity in the brain or is it the other yeah. way around? Do the brain waves, the brain waves stimulate activity? No, they're created by the um, neuro, neuronal uh, activity. Um, there's, there's still a puzzle uh, when it comes to uh, some of the, the fastest um, or, or most active brain waves. So, so we've only talked about the ones that are mostly present while we sleep. Um, but there are three um, waking brain waves. So there's sort of the alpha waves, or sort of the you're resting, but you're not quite asleep. Uh, you might be sort of just yeah, relaxing. You might even be watching mm-hmm. television. And um, you're certainly... Um, very calm and sort of very slow in some way. Your, your mind is, is still slow if that's sort of the dominant uh, brainwave. So if you just sort of close your eyes and you sort of really relax um, and you have electrodes on your skull, then uh, with a bit of luck, we could identify a dominant brainwave signal coming from um, alpha wave um, signal coming from your brain. When, mm-hmm. you're, um, when you're a lot more conscious and focused on things, you're having a conversation with a, another person um, or you're solving um, a task, you're thinking about how to do something, uh, then we are uh, up in a faster a kind of brainwave, the, the better waves. Um, mm-hmm. And then um, when I said like the, the mystery is that when we come to the, the gamma waves, uh, they are the, the fastest uh, waves that... Um, that that at least seems to to occur in the in the human brain. Um, so they're very very um, sort of information is passed on very very quickly um, when you have these mm-hmm. gamma waves when they are dominant. Um, and and uh, the problem is that it's not exactly clear how the how the neurons are actually generating these gamma waves how are the gamma waves get generated from the neurons we don't know exactly because that signal or that the gamma waves are actually faster than the neurons own signal so so in that hmm. sense so so gamma um, gamma is above the frequency of uh, neuronal uh, firing so so it's sort of a, a mystery how can you have something that, that fires at a bit, a bit slower, even when it fires um, at, at a high rate, right? So it, it, if you measure a single neuron or a few neurons, uh, you don't get gamma waves, right? But then if you right. have a lot of neurons firing together, apparently that can generate gamma, gamma waves. So, so that's, uh, so that's a, bit, a bit of a mystery, but it's clear for, for all the other waves, it's clear that they are generated by the neurons firing in your brain. Right. Um, the, so the, the, gamma waves the neurons fire. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the gamma waves are something else is going on. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, of course, most people would say that, well, it still have to, has something to do with the neurons. It's just that apparently that wave is generated in a way we don't know from when you have a lot of uh, neurons firing together, and especially when they fire um, together, meaning in synchrony, um, that, that for some reason that can give you um, a kind of frequency that you don't observe for, for individual or even small groups of neurons. Right. When, what, when, you, when, when they have, scientists have observed or doctors have observed the gamma rays, what kind of things were going on? Is, I mean, is there, was there something going on with the subject or, or with the, the thoughts going on in the subject? Was there any kind of even just hypothesis as to what's going on inside the brain that actually results in these gamma rays, these gamma waves? Yeah, I mean, this, again, we haven't figured out how they're generated, um, but right. they tend to be generated when, uh, when a lot of neurons fire together 
Mm-hmm. So, but a lot of neurons can fire, um, but not together. So there's, there's a, there can be a certain uh, synchrony in the firing in a certain region of the brain. And, and that seems to be what generates uh, gamma wave activity. Not, uh, not necessarily just that, but, but that has led uh, some researchers to think that that's really um, when you have this, these gamma waves in the brain, that's really when you have phenomenal consciousness, although that's um, a still a hypothesis. It's not, it's not true. Okay, that so that's, that's the potential correlation to the phenomenal experience or, or these gamma waves. Yes. So, so you don't need to have dominant uh, gamma waves. I mean, that's, that's quite unusual to, to have a sort of a domination of gamma waves. But, but what they are thinking is that if, even if your brain has a, dominant, uh, a dominance of, of, say, alpha waves or beta waves, um, there might be gamma waves in sort of those neurons uh, that are involved in your conscious thought or your conscious perception, that they might be firing in synchrony uh, and generating gamma waves. So, so in that sense, it might be a correlate of, of consciousness. Uh, in, so not in the, in the sense that the other brain waves are not involved. They certainly are involved, but they may not be uh, sort of the correlate of the conscious part of your thought. They might be involved in other, other parts of, of your mental state. So, so okay. the, the representational part, for example. So the information, uh, if, you, if you think about what you had for breakfast uh, this morning, then you there's of course there's, a, there's the conscious part of that but there's also the especially if you picture it right there's a phenomenal consciousness a phenomenal mm-hmm. quality to that but there's also the information right so maybe you had pancakes for breakfast uh, so that information may, may not be uh, the correlate of that may, may need not be the, the gamma waves uh, presumably it's not because we know that that memory is of course a stored without any consciousness um, that's when what it, what it means for them to, to be stored or distributed um, across the brain. Uh, and so the information, of course, uh, does an informational part to conscious thought and conscious perception. And that informational part, uh, presumably, is not directly correlated to, to uh, any brain waves as such. I mean, they, they probably are mm. correlated to some brain waves, but not the gamma waves. Um, there's... There's, a, there's some very, very, very slow uh, brain waves um, that are even slower than the delta waves. And it may be that these very, very, they, they sometimes called the infralow brain waves. So they're less than mm-hmm. 0.5 hertz. So they're slower than the delta waves. And they may be sort of the, the rhythm that's required to even have, say, something stored in the brain. You can't just have something stored in the brain without any activity going on, right? There will have to be some activities to keep um, any, any neuron that's not active uh, would, would, right. slowly die, would slowly die, right? So we would quickly die. So, so that sort of infralow um, activity may be involved actually even when we are unconscious. Uh, I mean, so, so, so in areas of the brain where, say, the information of what you had for breakfast this morning is stored, um, it may be sort of maintained by infralow um, brain waves. Yeah, like a, like a base. So somebody, somebody who's in a coma, for example, what, what kind of brain waves are measured with their brains? It varies, um, actually, a lot because mm. um, so as people, coma has been... Um, it's sort of been redefined um, over the years. So it was at one point, coma um, was thought to be more or less the same as what later became known as being a vegetative or in a vegetative state or something like that. But a coma need not um, need not have very low brain waves. It can it can have brain waves that that are that correspond to sleep brain waves, so delta waves, theta waves. Um, you can even have a, a coma patients who seem to have something like dreams going on. So, so you, there might even be higher brain waves in areas of the brain, not dominant, but in areas of the brain of people in, co- in a coma. But of course, the closer you come to what we might call somebody who's brain dead, 
right? The, the less activity uh, you find. Um, and, and, but even when, when someone is brain dead, as long as the brain is not, the brain is not actually dead when your brain dead, right? Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's simply when, when, we, when we declare someone brain dead, um, it's, a, it's, it's at a point when the, the chance of recovering any form of consciousness is thought to be sort of uh, very, very, very small. And in that case, yeah, it may be that we probably don't see, certainly don't see, probably don't see theta waves, um, probably not delta waves, but we, uh, but, but there, there are some waves, of course, um, that are higher than the infralow waves because as long as, as they are still, if they're still breathing, um, presumably if they're brain dead, they might not be, but um, if certain functions of the body are still going on, there might be parts of the brain that are still um, sort of the, the parts of the brain that are controlling those functions of the body um, might have locally higher waves attached to them, but they wouldn't be dominant, sort of, they, the brain wouldn't be dominated by delta waves or theta waves, for example. Okay. Now, some of this, talking about brain waves, and it may not be directly correlated, but it reminds me of uh, Giulio Tononi and Christoph Koch, who, looked, who worked in the integrated information theory. And I know when I talked to uh, Christoph Koch about it, he thinks one day, and it's funny, you mentioned a tree. You said, you know, we have consciousness, a dog has consciousness, but probably not a tree. And I asked him, I said, well, do you think you two are going to be able to measure consciousness in a stone? And he said, yes, I think we probably will. So I don't know if you reviewed or looked over their stuff or have any thoughts on, on IIT and, and yeah. them and what they're measuring. And, you know, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, my collaborators and I have actually um, recently written uh, a paper on, on these theories um, mm. Yeah, I think there's, some, there's definitely something to them. We don't think that um, that, that explains um, consciousness fully, um, but it certainly it certainly um, is. It's possible that that it's it's, it's a necessary um, condition for certain forms of consciousness. So integrated information. Um, when you have integrated information, you have um, basically higher forms of consciousness. So. So if you integrate information, we, well, here's a very simple example. Um, you, um, you need to, to, let's say you have a cube that's red, right? So the cube, then you, know, you have a shape and you have a color and you need to somehow integrate those in order to even have, be conscious of the object. Uh, so right. when you have those kinds of um, um, intentional which means like world directors, outward directors, forms of consciousness, consciousness mm -hmm. that represents something out in the external world, then yes, you have integrated information and that may be a requirement for having consciousness like that. But it's not the only form of consciousness that we have. As we just talked before about um, people who meditate, they don't have necessarily in form of integration or information integration um, going on mm -hmm. if they're sort of present in their own minds. So, so I'm not able to actually get to that point in any form of meditation. So I don't know what it's like, but the way they describe it is that they're not paying attention to anything, right? Or if they're paying attention to anything, they're paying attention to the, the breath or something like that. And it's not clear that um, if they're really not paying attention to anything, um, they, they are lacking that, that in attention that would be involved in integrating information. It's not clear that, that information integration is involved, they're, they're, but they're still conscious. They, their brain waves are slower um, but in that case, but, but it's still a form of consciousness. So, right. so I'm not sure that, that uh, the, the integrated information theory can, um, can explain all forms of of consciousness, but it certainly helps explain how we can become conscious in the sense that many people are interested in. How do we become conscious of the world, for example, or of mm -hmm. our surroundings, um, or, or the consciousness that's involved in retrieving a memory, or the consciousness that's involved in completing a task where we put some conscious energy in, into it. Um, right. But but there's even um, 
Camacho has even um, speculated that uh, that uh, babies that are born without um, parts of their brain, uh, they may, basically they're born without a new cortex. So that's basically mm -hmm. the part of the brain that we sort of associate with with the integration of the information into conscious representations of the world. But they're born without those parts. They still have um, some minimal parts of the brain that can sort of keep them breathing and um, and even um, perhaps react em uh, emotionally. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't smell and so on because um, cortical areas of the brain are involved in seeing, for example, right? So that's a visual cortex. Right. But they're lacking that. So they're blind, they're deaf, they're not, they can't feel. Um, but, uh, but, but there's some... Uh, there's some signs, so there's a lot of disagreement about this, but there's some signs that they actually are able to, they are responding in some way in, in what the parts that they have left of their brain somehow are able to detect um, what's going on around them. And they appear to have uh, some more fundamental elementary form of consciousness. So that's the master's um, theory. Um, and if, if they have a fundamental form of consciousness, then to the to the extent that that information is integrated uh, well we would have to then redefine what that what that means for information to be integrated because if they're lacking cortex then what does it mean for information to be integrated of course there's information in everything right in the computer and so on but 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 the kinds of information integration that um that these other guys uh, who have defended the um integrated information theory uh, are talking about that's not what's going on in in these babies. So, so I'm not mm. convinced that, that they will be able to explain consciousness as such. Although it's certainly a helpful theory in terms of explaining what a lot of people are interested in. So perception, memory, um, cognition, right, uh, and so on, and, right. and, and attention. Attention presumably is part of of this. Um, integrated information i mean the information integration is is sort of comes along where it goes along with with attention and and uh, there, there are philosophers who've defended as similar theories like jesse prince uh is has defended um, a theory that's uh, somewhat similar to to the integrated information theory um it also it also has some differences, but he actually focuses a lot on attention, and he actually proposes that a certain form of attention is basically um, what is required and perhaps even sufficient uh, for for consciousness. Now, hmm. that's um, again that may be true for a certain um, human being with a certain kind of brain, and so on. Um, but it's probably not true if it's true, if it's true that these babies that are born without uh, uh, any neural cortex um, and just have fundamental, basically the brain that would be similar to, um, to reptiles, right? But, 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 not, but not even as functional as, as the brains of a reptile because they, are not meant, they were not meant to have... Um, a brain that was lacking the neocortex, whereas a reptile brain uh, was meant to be the way that it is. So that's more functional. And right. these babies usually die after two to three years. Some of them live to, mm. until they, they're a little bit older, six or seven. So obviously something's wrong. So, so they are not even, the brain is even not, not even as functional as a reptile brain, but presumably the reptile um, has some forms of consciousness, but maybe these babies do too. And then the question is like, what, what do we mean if in information integration is still what's supposed to explain what's going on in their brains, then, um, then, then maybe we need to, to, to redefine some of the elements of those theories. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That um, makes sense. And one thing I actually don't know um, that now, now that you are mentioning it, I might look, look it up is whether anyone has actually tried to measure, um, sort of scientifically, I'm not thinking about just doctors or whatever, but some researchers have actually looked at the brain activity of some of those babies uh, without the neocortex. I'm not sure whether Demacio, uh, Demacio has looked at any or whether he's using the data that's provided from 
from hospitals and so on. But but that would be interesting right. to to look up. Yeah. Yeah, that would be to see what's going on there. Uh, which I guess kind of leads me to the next part, and I do want to make sure we get to the things that you you also study over time. Is uh, but the next one is you know the baby's born without the neocortex, um, kind of relates to traumatic brain injuries. So what what have you observed? I, and I know in different laboratories that you've run, I think you studied this uh, TBI traumatic brain injuries. So what have you seen and and how those just like these babies, how the injuries also relate to that subject's consciousness and, and what have you learned about consciousness from these studies? Yeah. And, um, in most cases of traumatic brain injury, of course, uh, you just have a reduction, uh, in, in consciousness in the sense that you have, uh, perhaps lost certain abilities. You might have, um, lost your vision, right? You, have, you might have damages to, to the visual cortex and so on. But the ones that we have studied, um, are, are people where, where that might happen, but something else happens as well. They gain an ability they didn't have before. So, so they do become somewhat disabled uh, in the cases that we mm -hmm. looked at. Uh, their disability varies uh, in degree and in kinds. Um, and some of them develop uh, autistic traits, um, for example. Uh, but... The, some of the people that we looked at, they suddenly have um, a reorganization or restructure of some areas of the brain um, such that they now are, have an ability they didn't have before. So there's an example, uh, Jason Paget suddenly uh, became very interested in math, but not just interested, but he also had some insights in math that he certainly would not have had before he wouldn't even he didn't even have the interest before in in, in mathematics. Um, Derek Amato uh, wasn't interested in music before his injury. Uh, he was interested in sports. He was a salesman. Then he started playing the piano, and a year later he's basically playing um, across the country uh, and internationally, and was um, uh, selling records and so on. Um, we have other examples of of people who had accidents. There's one, one subject that we are um, talking to right now. She has um, suddenly an ability to write uh, poetry. That's, of course, harder to evaluate, but you can um, usually you can sort of get a sense from people who actually know anything about poetry, whether it's, um, it's, it's, whether it's, it's really sort of good poetry or, or just like a bunch of words. Yeah. That's written down. It's like and, jazz music. Is this good or not? Right, exactly. And then, um, and then there's a, another subject we also have looked at. She, um, she started drawing um, uh, after uh, a brain injury um, and um, drawing in quite amazing ways. Uh, again, that was, that was evaluated by, by people who actually know something about, um, uh, about art. So it seems that um, a certain... Uh, a certain uh, disability or certain damage to the brain um, can enhance other areas of the brain. And the sort of leading theory of what's going on is that, um, that the, if you damage certain parts of, of um, your higher executive areas, that those are the areas in the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, uh, where what you use in sort of, thinking very carefully about what you do, but also controlling yourself, um, behaving mm -hmm. the way you're supposed to behave and um, doing what you're supposed to do, being dutiful, um, doing your work, making sure you pay your rent on time and so on. When you damage some of those areas in the brain, it seems that um, that, that is potentially what enhances uh, some of the more creative and in some cases, mathematical areas of the brain. Um, and so the, the leading theory is simply that um, when you're going around, walking around and making sure you pay your rent on, on time and, um, and so on, and you've saved money, uh, maybe you have kids who save money for their college, um, you're being a good, uh, a good person and so on, uh, you, you also um, put a break on your creativity. So that's the idea that the, that, that the prefrontal cortex, 
the executive areas of the brain can somehow put a break on your 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 creativity, your what you're able to, what you're interested in. So so mm. there's not going to be a, a lot of time left over to play the piano if you have enough. Uh, <laughs> you have all these other thoughts, yeah. right, about paying your rent and getting, you know, you know the kid off, kids off to school, remembering to send lunch with them uh, or lunch money and so on and so on. So, so the thought is that um, that that break, you can actually um, have an injury in the prefrontal areas of the brain that can somehow um, loosen that break. So. If you imagine that the, the prefrontal cortex is sort of con- constantly putting a break on, on um, a lower, sometimes right, more right sides, um, uh, sided abilities, um, suddenly that area of the brain that put that break on it, right, is damaged. Like if you were breaking uh, for stopping the car for rats, uh, but you damage right. your, your foot or your, your leg, then the car won't stop because you're not able to push the brake anymore. So, so now, um, the, now the car is just like um, running on its own. And the thought is that when you take that brake away from the, those areas, um, typically sort of right, we call them right side uh, brain skills. They're not really just right side brain skills, but, um, mm-hmm. but, but the, creative, the creative parts of uh, or your creative abilities uh, can sort of be allowed to develop and also, if you are less, this is this is more the less um, fantastic um, part of the explanation is that if you're not no longer interested or concerned with these things that we normally are very concerned with, because that's what it takes to be sort of an, a good functioning person. Um, now you don't have those abilities to function anymore, so you're no longer thinking about oh what. Did I remember to buy milk? Uh, now I have to go to the supermarket and so on. No, they, some of the subjects that we looked at, they cannot do that anymore. Um, so all of that, um, that time and that energy is sort of probably um, left over to be used elsewhere. That's sort of the less, less sort of uh, fantastical way of explaining it. That, yeah, if we could just all stop worrying about everyday things, then we could all do uh, things like start playing the piano, uh, start writing poetry, and if we do it for yeah. uh, enough hours in a day, right? Over uh, there's a ten thousand hours theory. Then after a year or so, maybe we would be like fantastic pianists and so on. So that's a less fantastical one, but it still sort of involves the same story about that the prefrontal cortex is putting a damper or, or a break on creativity and um, other areas of the brain having to do with, with mathematics, which also can be, can be, uh, or can involve creativity. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. It ties into some other notions about the brain being a filter, but I don't think, I don't think they're directly related, but it sure brings it up, you know, for me and the other conversations I've had. What about, um, let's get into the, I'm really curious about the synesthesia and also in the, the Savant syndrome. So we're not talking about um, damaged brains in those cases. We're talking about uh, very particular uh, circumstances or conditions. So, you know, what, I guess, talk a little bit about uh, a synesthete experience or a Savant experience and, and how, you know, that relates to consciousness and, and, what's, and what's even happening in the brain, you know, with these conditions. Yeah, so synesthesia is when when you have two sensory channels uh, in the brain that mix in unusual ways. So the most common form of synesthesia is when you see numbers and letters uh, in mm-hmm. colors, uh, if they're, even mm. if they're printed, printed in black. Um, there's uh, also uh, sound, color synesthesia is also um, common. And that's uh, when you hear, say, musical notes, you, they, they, uh, you see them in colors. Uh, so... Mm. So people who have um, color or musical note to color synesthesia um, are sometimes able to, or they, they, they automatically have perfect pitch, which means that they can identify a musical note without yeah. hearing uh, the one that's, that's uh, in the neighborhood of that, that note. Uh, 
because um, we don't need, if the colors are set, uh, distinct enough, then we don't need to see, so in order for you to see a red cup, you don't uh, need to see it in relation to a blue cup. So, so you can just see a red, red cup and you can see, oh, it's, a, it's red. It's not like I have to bring in a blue cup and then you look at the two in there and now you see that the one is red and the other is blue. But with right. musical notes, that's how we normally do it. We have to see them in a context. Um, so even trained, most trained mathematic, uh, musicians would have to see or hear them uh, in, in the context of each other. But when they have the colors associated with them, then suddenly the colors become the work the way that colors work uh, for us. And they can just, ah, that's red. Well, okay, that's a C. Um, or that's blue. Oh, that's a D. So, so that um, can give uh, rise to, to some interesting abilities. In terms of, of consciousness, um, what, we, what we have seen is that in some, uh, some people, even people who have this the synesthesia from, from when they're very young, it's, it's definitely learned or acquired. Um, but so we can, we can see the differences in the brains between those people where it's learned or acquired and people where it's uh, simply a structural wiring in the brain um, that is non-existent in the rest of us. So there are some people who have, say, sound uh, color synesthesia, where you can see that there's a direct connection. So when you put them in a brain scan, you can see there's a direct connection between uh, areas that process a musical note to sounds in the brain mm. and, and colors or for the, the, the letters, so the graphemes, the letters and numbers to color, uh, you can see form areas of the brain being connected directly with, with color areas. So in that case, there is a connection in the brain or an integration of information, uh, to go back to that idea, um, that's, uh, that is not existing in, uh, other, um, in other subjects. So, so this is... Um, this is, of course, um, it sort of feeds into what we talked about before, that, uh, that a certain integration of information uh, is, is needed uh, for, probably is needed for certain forms of consciousness to, to arise. And, and what we are looking at with synesthesia is how do forms of different kinds of information integrate in these cases in ways that's unusual and um, that um, differ from how they're integrated in other people. We're also interested in, in what, to what extent it has to do with um, the pruning of the brain. So we know that mm. we, start up, we, start up with, uh, we start out with a lot more connections in the brain, but not, not very functional connections in the brain. So babies have sort of, well, that's a metaphor, but you can sort of imagine like every neuron is connected in some way to every other neuron, but there's no, there's no sort of, designated pathways in the brain, right? So over right. the years, the baby grows and becomes um, a child and then um, adolescent and so on, the brain gets pruned, which means that, uh, that some of these uh, connections are simply um, sort of taken, uh, taken out or they, they, they disappear and other connections are strengthened. Uh, and, and so, so, one theory um, that Julius Simner, um, a synesthesia researcher, has proposed uh, with collaborators is that it's basically some of the same um, disorders of pruning. So there's certain disorders of pruning where that, that we, we know can give rise to, to various um, immune system related diseases and so on, may also Ooh. be uh, related to people who have synesthesia of this form, where it's a mistake in the pruning mechanisms that actually allow for a kind of integration of information that is not seen in, in other people. Um, so, so there's that um, hypothesis, but, but it seems quite clear that there are other um, synesthetes, even when they have it from a young age, where it is learned, because it's been found simply that... Um, that you, when you have kids who have seen, uh, had refrigerator magnets, right, with the letters and numbers, mm -hmm. um, and they're uh, from a certain time period where 
a certain kind of refrigerator magnets were sold that were popular, you can actually go back and find out, and some researchers have done that, and have found out that, oh, some synesthetes uh, apparently got it from the magnets. But does that mean that they just remember the magnets? No, it doesn't mean that, because the test of synesthesia uh, is actually, actually a test of whether it's a perceptual, uh, a kind of perceptual ability uh, it's not it, it, it just remembering. It's not just sort of or even associating two things. It's it's um, it's much more perceptual uh, and automatic. Um, so so even though it may have come from those refri those refrigerator magnets, uh, that doesn't mean that it's just still remembering that oh the A was red because it's not it's yeah. not at all like that. It's um, it becomes part of the perceptual system. And so yeah. it somehow it forms and cha shapes the perceptual system such that the system now perceives in a way that's different. Uh, so it's a kind of perceptual learning, in fact. Yeah, and it becomes that qualia, it sounds like. So I know that something, something reminds me of that, you know, if I smell baking apple pie, maybe I think of my grandmother. Those are two things that are associated in my that's head. Right. But it's different when, a, when a, you play a C on a piano and I see purple, and th those two senses are, are fully tied together. Yeah, and so, yeah, so of course if you smell apple pie and you think of your grandmother, that can be, be pretty automatic as well. That's also why we talk about triggers in, um, after trauma, for example, right, it can be triggers, and so that's pretty automatic. But, but the phenomenal quality what it's like to have it is, is yeah. that it's, 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 it's in some people much more perceptual meaning if you are seeing your grandmother or seeing an apple pie uh perceptually visually um the 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 colors and so on are usually a lot more vivid even if you were good at remembering in pictures or in images uh when you see the apple pie it will be the details will be um at least, if you if you have uh, wear glasses or you are, you have your sight is 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 is, is, uh, is pretty good, then you you the details and the col the colors will have a different quality to them. Then if you me remember, mm -hmm. even if you picture an apple pie, right, yeah. it will be much more faded out colors. If you even have colors, it will be the details won't be there. There will be the details change if you sort of move around in your mental imagery, um, and so there's a different difference in what it's like to have the memory and what it's like to have a perception. And when they have a perception, it's simply, they perceive, say, the color blue when they hear a musical note. Uh, so they're not just remembering the color blue when they hear a musical note. Um, but yeah. they, in some sense, see it. Um, and then how they see it um, is, is, that differs a lot, uh, something that we're still looking into. but. One thing that is uh, for sure is that they're not seeing uh, seeing it in the way that we can talk about seeing things in our memory. So, um, like, we can walk around in a mental image. Uh, so I usually do this with my students uh, when, uh, when I teach philosophy of mind or something along those lines. And I have them uh, picture their living room um, or shared living room, whatever they have from this, this morning. Right. And take a tour around in their living room, uh, sort of a mental tour around and, um, and tell uh, sort of what, 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 what are the, and then we go into the details, what are the colors? Of course, some of that they, they can remember that um, the, the couch has a certain color, but some of it is not something they can remember. And they also cannot necessarily see it, right? When they walk around their mental picture uh, uh, image, because if they could, then they would in some sense remember it. Um, when I said that they might remember that it's blue, what I mean is they might uh, have a semantic memory where they know that their couch is blue. Um, that's a little bit different from this episodic memory, um, which is more perception-like. That's a kind where you can sort of walk around in your image. But that's completely, um, it's completely different from, from the perceptual quality that you have. When synesthetes have these colors, they have not just say blue, right? Or light blue or dark blue. They have a very, very specific, so the hue is blue, blue, red, yellow, those are the hues. They also have a very, very specific brightness, 
to the color because they're asked to, to, to specify brightness when they're tested for it. Um, and then they uh, have um, a saturation. So saturation is um, how much whiteness or how much um, blackness that is color. So, so it's a particular shade of color with a particular brightness. And every time they're tested, they pick that one out where they have to actually move the cursor on a computer around and pick the brightness and pick um, out of all the different shades uh, that you can imagine of say blue. Um, and yeah. then the distance is measured from the, di the different times they're tested. And if the if distance is too great, then they don't test as having synesthesia. So that's just one of the tests of whether they have synesthesia. Um, if the distance in color space is, yeah, they pick blue every time, but they, one time they picked uh, sort of middle blue and then it was a little bit lighter the next time and so on. Um, then if that happens too much, then that will, they will not score as, as, as soon as these. So, so it's very, very perceptual mm. because we, in perception, that's exactly what happens when we have ordinary perception, uh, say vision. Yeah. Um, we, we don't just see blue, right? We see a very specific blue, uh, very, very specific brightness, very, very specific saturation, but not in memory. We can perhaps see something as more darker blue or, or, or lighter blue, but we don't see it with that kind of precision as we do in perception. So there's, there's definitely a difference here. And, and, um, and so, so, so what we're looking at is information integration. Um, so again, that's a certain kind of consciousness that is that probably requires this kind of information integration. Okay. All right. Um, we're getting we're to the point to wrap up here. I want to make sure that uh, was there anything that I forgot to ask you or should have asked you on these subjects? Uh, I don't think so. Um, no, I mean, uh, we, we got around okay. a lot of stuff and there's always a lot to talk about. So, yeah. 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 With somebody with your breadth, all the different things that you've studied over the years, it's uh, so much we could talk about, but what do you, what do you have uh, coming up in your own work in the, in the near future? What are you going to be working on and what breakthroughs do you possibly see coming in the understanding, even the scientific understanding of consciousness, consciousness out there? Um, yes, yeah, so um, we have a potential subject. It's a, it's a very new one. We haven't uh, really gone through the testing yet, uh, although the, we, we, we have um, been on the phone. The person is not in, in Miami, but this is, this is actually a, a child subject uh, who um, mm -hmm. was kept um, outside of the external world, sort of in a cage uh, for... Mm -hmm. um, first few years of her life and and apparently that gave rise to um, a kind of uh, disorder that seems a bit um, it's not autism because autism is a different disorder and it's not um, right. it doesn't arise as a result of how people um, are treated at least that's the current belief but it has some similarities in common with autism and and sure enough um, this um, little girl has, um, it seems that she has some quite amazing forms of synesthesia, both musical, as a musical note to color, but also graphemes uh, to color, and, and even um, different, different forms of writing can give rise, have their own colors, uh, which is not a problem for testing because you would always use the same font or something in a, in a test. Um, right. So, so this is uh, potentially a case uh, where um, where we where we would have um, perhaps maybe not well we at least have evidence for that synesthesia um, and and she also has a savat so she has these special abilities um, speaks five languages sings in five languages she's eight um, oh. and and, um, and so. In, so, so, so in this case, though, we can perhaps look at the information that, of course, when, when, when she was found and adopted, um, there were records and medical records and so on. So it's possible that we can actually uh, 
find out what is it uh, that went on in terms of Dr. Brogard, I think I lost you. So, so, yeah, it says uh, the connection is. Are you, do you hear me? Yep. No, you're back. You're back. It's good. Okay. And I just it was when they uh, you're studying her and finding out, and then I lost you at that right at that point. Um. So, given that the medical records from when they when they found her and she got adopted, um, and examined mm -hmm. medically examined and adopted, um we may be able to look at uh, what exactly um, this, or how exactly these savant abilities of synesthesia, how does that come about, not just as a result of, say, how uh, you, are, you are genetically wired um, such that your pruning mechanisms uh, don't work, but also what is it like in, in terms of early brain maturation, um, that when that goes wrong, how can that then lead to these, in some cases, amazing abilities um, that we don't have or see in, in ordinary uh, children? Yeah. So, so that's one project. Yeah. That we, well, that sounds fascinating. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from that. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, I bet. What, anything else on the, that you're going to be working on? I'm also curious to know your opinion on what you think might be coming in the field of consciousness and what, you know, we might be learning in the, you know, nearish future. Yeah. So uh, I have some collaborators at university of Miami who um, are hoping to be able to uh, measure um, the brain activity of individual neurons. This is, um, first of all, it requires a special equipment, but also it's, is not something you normally can do in humans because you get put electrodes to, into hum, to, to people's brains. Uh, you're going right. to get ethical permission to do that. But if people have to have electrodes implanted into the brain because they have severe cases of uh, epilepsy or something else, um, mm -hmm. you, you can, um, and they agree to be subjects, you can potentially measure individual uh, neurons and sort of get closer, uh, or get a close up of what um, what are the, the that kind of activity uh, and how does that relate to consciousness? Um, it's right. sort of like a, a next step in terms of finding out whether there is something to the idea that certain kinds of synchrony of firing uh, at a at a certain frequency um, might be related to to um, to consciousness, um, hmm. which which um, sort of goes back to the question I never answered, which when you said, like, could you measure the, the brain waves? Well, there wouldn't be brain waves, but the wave, the conscious waves of a stone one day. Well, uh, if the theory that there is an elementary form of consciousness and everything is correct, then yes, you should be able to when you get more sensitive instruments. Um, so this, of course, is, is we're, we're not even close to that, but this would be a next step if we could actually go in and, and start measuring individual neurons because now we are, or even a few neurons, because if we're down at, on, on the cell level, then um, we are at a completely different level in terms of the research than if we are just measuring brain waves on the skull outside of uh, on people's heads. So, so, that's yeah. a, so that's a very exciting step. Uh, it's only at the level of, um, of a grant application with, uh, that that's, um, a colleague of mine has started and has gotten a lot of people from different departments involved in. So um, hopefully uh, that will go through at some point and, um, and we can make a big leap. That's, that's a hope in terms of, at least in terms of testing the theory about whether a certain kind of firing rate is, is involved in, in consciousness, but also perhaps finding out how are those gamma waves created from yeah. neuro, neurons that don't fire at that frequency, right? So, so that's, that mm -hmm. would also be a big sort of leap in consciousness studies. Yeah, I mean, it makes you almost feel like you can almost see the horizon finally, you know, of all, all the different yeah. ideas and concepts that what you're describing there makes me feel like, wow, almost, there's almost something there on the horizon that – 
with that study and, and the next one that, you know, maybe we're getting to a point where we can, like you said yeah. in the very beginning, I think this scientifically one is, explain it. I think this one is promising because um, this is uh, the, my colleague, um, Andrew Dijkstra, is actually from, he has a joint appointment in engineering, biomedical engineering and uh, in, in psychology, but he has gotten people on board from basically all not all disciplines, a lot of different disciplines at University of Miami. Um, and so mm -hmm. I'm just one of the, 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 the co-PIs on, on this application. But, but, but uh, the benefit here is, is that um, we have different things that we can contribute. Uh, so like you, none of us, like not even uh, the PI, Andrew Drickstore, can actually insert electrodes into the brain of a person. We wouldn't be allowed to, right? Because right. that's how right. I feel. Um, but uh, somebody in psychology um, knows certain things about neuroscience. Somebody who is in physics and is interested in neuroscience knows uh, a sort of the neuroscience on a different level, sort of a more low level typically, um, much lower level in terms of, of um, the cells, the individual cells, um, and so on. So by getting sort of many different people from many different uh, disciplines involved uh, in this project, and if we can actually go in and measure individual neurons, I think we actually can sort of make progress, uh, right? We won't be done after that, but we can make progress. Wonderful. Well, we all need to keep an eye on what you guys are working on there. That sounds very exciting. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Brogard, that is it. I, I'm really grateful for your time this morning, and I uh, can't thank you enough for, for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, really great questions. That concludes another edition of the Consciousness Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Please find us at Facebook at facebook.com slash the Consciousness Podcast, at our Twitter handle at ConchCast, and don't forget to subscribe to our feed at theconsciousnesspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.